Hello, welcome to the Little Physics Lab. I'm going to tell you a little bit about Millikan, a fantastic experimentalist, a brilliant uh, investigator who did a very famous experiment where he found the size of the charge on the electron. Now, I'm not actually going to tell you about the experiment itself because a friend of mine has done a much better job of it. So I am going to put in a, a quick plug for this site here. This is A-Level Physics Online, and with the aid of a, a Lego model of the experiment that I'm frankly jealous of, it's done an excellent job of explaining the ins and the outs of Millikan's experiment. What I do want to do is just point out a couple of extra things. So Millikan was incredibly lucky with this experiment in terms of the kind of the size of his uh, of the oil droplets involved and the kind of size of the potential difference involved. And then there's a little bit of kind of scientific controversy around it. So let's dive into that. So to start with, his uh, potential difference, he was really lucky with the kind of the experiment, uh, the experimental setup. So here is a really rough uh, drawing of this uh, investigation. You have a power supply, you've got two plates. This one here is usually, uh, well, let's say it's negative and this one here is, uh, no, let's say this one is positive and this one's negative. And our little oil droplet sits in there. So our oil droplet has got a mass of mg. So it, our investigation relies on this being a little bit charged, usually a little bit negative charged, and we have enough potential difference across this in order to balance this out. It helps to know a few of the dimensions. So this here is about 0 0.02 meters something like that. It's quite a small chamber. It's very difficult to get a high enough vacuum in a much bigger chamber. And also you need to light this thing from the side so you can see it. And there are a number of practical difficulties. And that's one of the reasons why he was such a good experimentalist. And let's assume that this droplet is a kind of a sphere of oil. I can say that that mg is going to be the same as, so I need to work out the mass, so I'm going to say that it's 4 thirds pi r cubed. So that is the volume of the sphere multiplied by the density of the oil and multiplied by this gravitational constant. I also know that in this weight must be balanced or the uh, assumption our experiment relies on this weight being balanced by the electrical attraction. So the electric field strength multiplied by the charge must be the same as this. And so actually I can exploit this a little bit and I can say that my potential difference over the size of my chamber 0 0.02 multiplied by the charge. So this is starting to put some typical values in. If I keep going with some typical values of, say, the density of oil, which is 850 kilograms per meter cubed, give or take, and if I put in a sort of a typical radius, let's say it's 5 times 10 to the minus 7 meters, then that's going to require that I have a potential difference across these two plates of about 550 volts. That's a fairly significant potential difference across quite a small gap. And certainly, if the radius was much different, if it was a little bit larger, say 10 times larger, then this would be unfeasible. So Millikan was really lucky to have for his, that his oil droplets were about this size. But it's more than that. He was even more lucky because actually there is um, an issue with Brownian motion. So the Brownian motion is this kind of phenomenon whereby if you set up something which looks very, very much like the Millikan investigation, you have a little chamber like this, you shine a light in the side, you have some smoke in there, and the smoke particles appear to sort of jiggle around. And this is what I've drawn here. This is a smoke particle and it's bombarded on all sides by the molecules in the air. And so this appears to kind of jiggle around a bit. It turns out that 
if he, the smoke particles uh, are small enough, this effect is very much larger. So our oil droplets only needed to have been about five or ten times smaller and this Brownian motion would have kicked in and he wouldn't have been able to see anything at all because it would all be masked by Brownian motion. So a little bit, oil droplets a little bit larger and it wouldn't have worked, a little bit smaller and it wouldn't have worked. So I think that's pretty cool. But that isn't the kind of moralistic aspect of this story and it isn't my favourite bit. My favourite bit actually requires that we look at the graph. I've moved myself a little bit, but here is the graph of the value of the electron over a period of time. So Millikan published his value 1.59 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. And the error that he quoted was quite small. It turns out that the folk who came along next, Burge and Backlin, and repeated his investigation, their results were quite a bit different. And they were so intimidated, or, or so the tale goes, they're so intimidated by the kind of reputation of Millikan, who won the Nobel Prize for this investigation and was really renowned for being a fantastic experimental physicist. They were so intimidated by that that they discarded some of their higher results because they thought these must be too far off. And the same thing happened again when Kellstrom repeated it and same with Robinson and so on. If you actually look at Millikan's original notebooks, the error in his results were enormous. And so there's a bit of a scientific kind of moral there. If his results had been published in full with the full range of kind of results, the full range of errors, then all these guys here probably would have had the confidence to publish their results properly. As a result, we would have zeroed in on our current understanding probably much quicker. So there's a kernel of question here. Was it fraudulent what Millikan did, tidying up his results and discarding some of the ones he thought were way off? Or was it just being kind of prudent and trying to make sure that what he published had some integrity? And I think that's up to you, really. It's your pers your perspective on it. I've seen really good arguments to say, yes, it was fine to do that. And I've seen some good arguments to say it isn't. Personally, I'm of the belief that science should be as open and as public as possible. So we sh he should have published the full range of his data. And these guys in the middle then would have been um, much happier about their results. And we would have had m a more open and honest debate rather than this kind of, oh dear, we're too far off of what this amazing scientist did. So let's make ourselves look a bit better and get a bit closer to his value and discard some of these. My only conclusion is that it hampers scientific progress. So there you go, a giant in the world of physics who took physics forward a huge amount at the same time and with the same experiment potentially hindered us or hindered our understanding for many years. I think that's a really interesting little story and little background to the experiment. I hope you do too. Thanks for listening. See you next time.